This is a production of Cornell University. So, I'm Annalise Riles, and I'm sorry, I don't always talk in this dramatic voice. Um, uh, welcome to our fifth annual Clark Lecture. Um, Clark Lecture is really the highlight of our program in East Asian Law and Culture at the Law School. It's our chance to really showcase um, someone whose ideas are truly visionary and um, move the conversation in some fundamental way to bring them to Cornell uh, to engage not just the law school but the wider university community. And uh, we, of course, are delighted when, as with this year, we have uh, wonderful commentators who represent different disciplines to comment on the lecture. I'll tell you about, more about them um, as, the, as we get to that point in the program. Um, uh, as Stuart mentioned, this year's Clark Lecture is also the keynote for our spring conference, and you'll have the program for the conference here titled Law Markets and Social Equity. And I just want to take a moment to express my deepest gratitude to my good friend, Sui Zhu Yuan, here in the front, who uh, has been with us this year as the distinguished Wang visiting scholar in residence, visiting professor in residence, excuse me. And um, he's been teaching two courses. And it was really through uh, him that we uh, came to have the wonderful speaker that we have today. So I'm very grateful to you for that. Thank you. Uh, so the, the program you have in your hands is for a conference that is, has a very large subject. Really, the subject is what new or unnoticed forms of legal and institutional arrangements might promote the twin objectives of economic growth and social justice. And we'll solve all that by Saturday, I'm sure. Um, if not, we'll continue the conversation for years to come. It begins, though, at 9 a.m. tomorrow in the ISS conference room downstairs, so I hope to see many of you then. But today's Clark Lecture really brings all of this together for us better than we can imagine anyone else could, because this large question has really been his life project. Um, as both a scholar and an entrepreneur, um, um, uh, Professor Shi Changfu is a uh, professor of economics at Fudan University. He holds a PhD in economics from American University here in the United States. Um, his research, uh, are just a couple of his books, um, uh, uh, concentrates on a whole series of really important subjects like what should happen to uh, state-owned enterprises once, once they're privatized and how might the wealth of China be re-socialized in market-efficient ways, those kinds of really uh, complex and, and important subjects. Um, his work in economics has earned him China's most prestigious prize in economics, the Sunny Yifang Prize. He's also the founder of the Center for New Political Economy, and we're just very pleased to have several distinguished members of that center with us here today. And finally, he's also the founder and uh, principal of Conway Capital Limited, which is China's largest private equity fund. And so really his work in all of these very diverse areas uh, focuses um, on how privatization might serve wider social goals. And in that respect, he's one of China's most influential and visionary individuals, bar none, I would say. Um, he's really at the forefront of, de of defining and imagining what China's capitalist future should become. And his ideas about how market reforms can coexist with and even foster social justice have wide relevance, perhaps not just to China, but even to more stagnant economies like our own. So it's with great pleasure that we welcome you and honor you and look forward to your comments. Professor Shi Jiangfu, welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Dean Stewart and Professor Reyes, and thank you for inviting me here today. And, um, I'm greatly honored to have this opportunity to share with you my observation about the Chinese economic reform and growth. And uh, of course, first I would uh, extend my gratitude to you. And not only because uh, you know, I got this opportunity to visit this beautiful campus in this beautiful season, but also as I learned that this university has been a, a long tradition to uh, help Chinese education institution to develop their knowledge base by promoting intellectual exchanges between the two countries, you know. So as part of the tradition, and uh, I'm really feel honored, and I hope that and um, our work here 
uh, become not the uh, just beginning of new cooperation in the future. So, and the topic, as I mentioned, you know, is about Chinese economic reform. And uh, as we all know that uh, China's economy has been growing in a really fast speed, about 9% for 30 years. And this is a big thing, I guess. And more importantly, uh, as we know, the country has been uh, experienced a fundamental transformation from a system which we call communism and a central planning economy based on state ownership toward a market economy based on pluralist ownership including private business. Now how could that happen? That has been a question being asked many many times. A communist government led a transformation into a new system which in the future will undermine its ruling base. You know, so many of the intellectuals I, I, I met often ask the question, how could that happen? And uh, as I understand, understand that you know, when we talk about uh, this type of thing, we happen, often have something in mind and uh, like Soviet Union, a formal Eastern European countries, which have tried their best to reform their own system in almost 40 years between the 1960s to the later 1980s, but all of them failed. Now, why China is different? That, that, that is a question I have been thinking. I don't think I have the answer for that, but I got some observations which I want to share today. And uh, the central message I, I have here is now this. Chinese Communist Party is not the type of communist as you define it. <laughs> the central government of China is not the type of government as we all know it is. It's a different type of political party and uh, state. And, but I would like to begin with a story, a real story, which I happen to be involved in. Uh, a story about a concrete business corporation which uh, through 10 years of effort uh, from scratch grew into a global force in the big industry, automobiles industry. The company is called Cherry Corporation, which is located in a poor province, Anhui province. So I began with a story. That's 10 years ago. I don't know how to see if I can... Uh, okay, here. And that story basically is a success story. 1997, it started in an agriculture province called Anhui, a city called Buhu, famous for being a rice port, so rural situation, little human and financial capital resources. Now, but toward 99, the first car and engine produced there using an obsolete British production, actually, a production line bought from Ford Motor Company yeah, with probably 20 million US dollars, very cheap. And toward the year 2007, one million cars has been made and sold worldwide. 25%, about 25% of the cars has been exported throughout the world and become fourth largest car company in China market and number one in exporting cars from China into the world. And the most important that this company has been designated by both Chinese government and the major players in international car industry as the one with the highest probability to become a global player in automobiles industry. Mm -hmm. So within 10 years, beginning from a uh, really scratch, and uh, grow into such a big operation. And the car company today, together with a cluster of companies which produce auto parts, make almost more than half of the local economy. And uh, I happened to get an opportunity to invest into the company not long ago and help them to restructuring for preparing them for IPO in China. So I got to know the whole story by talking, you know, day and night with the CEOs and the local government leaders. 
Now, that shocked me, even though I know a lot of stories about Chinese entrepreneurship. Now, this is a special situation, so I picked up then to the... Now, for this company, the question really is, who are the real funders? Who are the entrepreneurs of this company? Now, I find that number one, the, the, the whole process uh, goes like this. Back to the middle 1990s, one guy called him Mr. Zhang here, and was required by the local government to study about how to promote the local economic development. Now, he was educated as a, in the literature and language department of Anhui University after many years of study, uh, working in the provincial government, come to be uh, assistant mayor of this city. So he was in he was charged of this task to come up with a study, a report. So he, he did some local survey and investigation and t- uh, review of the local companies and find out one company standing out, growing fast. A, bro- a, a group of peasants manufacturing motorcycle by very primitive technology <laughs> way. And that gave him some you know, thoughts and says even a motorcycle can create meanings and meanings of GDP. So what happens if we do something like automobiles? Now this is the idea he come up with. So he's, he sends a reporter to the city government with a mayor called Mr. Zhang Ping, the current uh, city commissioner in charge of this state planning uh, development and reform commission of the central government. At that time, he was this uh, mayor of the city. So the report was sent to the provincial government to make a decision because to fund a car company requires a lot of financial resources. Now, as a very backward provinces, that means you have to use the government channels to finance the deal. So then about a dozen of departments from the provincial government involved in the debate about why or sure way a lot to build this company. Now, after the many months of debate, finally the, 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 the decision being made by this one, one deputy governor of province, as in Wang Yang. Today, he's probably the top 10 to top five guys in Chinese government, one of the political bureau member and the party secretary of Guangdong <coughs> province. At that time, he was the deputy governor of Anhui province. So he heard all this debating controversial ideas about the risks and the advantages. And finally, he come up with a sentence saying, now in Chinese, 他妈的我们干嘛? I don't know how to translate it into English. Basically, he says, you know. <laughs> so he made his mind and uh, then mobilized all the resources he possibly mobilized. 1.7 billion Chinese renminbi, actually half of the money finally being moved into Wuhu to build this company. Now, then Mr. Chan, the guy who initiated this idea, was charged this task, saying, you are responsible for this project, for for success or failure. You are accountable for that. And nobody else in the government should be intervening this project. So Mr. Chan, as assistant mayor, was promoted to be vice mayor in charge of industry in the whole Wuhu city. And also, for a specific procedure approved by the Central Communist, uh, the, the Anhui Provincial Communist Party, he was appointed as the chairman of the company to be established without the name yet. So now he, he got approval of a certain amount of financial resource and the chairman, the title of the chairman of the company. Now the question is, where is the technology? Where is the people? Because this was the countryside. So he went out to, and fortunately I find the news about the Ford Motor Company was ready to sell a retired production line to produce small size engines. That's in England. So they have a group of people going to England to negotiating for buying this engine production line. And during that process, he find one guy called Mr. Ying, this CEO, the future CEO in Tongyao. He was only like uh, 29, 30 years old at the time. Uh, graduated from Anhui Institute of Engineering Studies and worked in China's first automotive plant, the largest Chinese automobiles company, 
and established in the 1950s by the Suez, Soviet Union experts. Now he worked in that company from you know, low-level engineers all the way to the key person in the joint venture between China and the Volkswagen. He's in, he was in charge of the General Assembly line, and he was sent to this country in 1989, uh, 99, about one and a half years in Pennsylvania plant to uh, learn the skills and to buy because they bought all the old production line. And so he, he got some training in this country and in a joint venture with Volkswagen. Our the deputy mayor, Mr. John, found him during the process of buying the equipment and found out that he's from Anhui province. So then he used the Chinese techniques to persuade Mr. Ying to quit his job from the big company into this one. The basic slogan is, come to manufacture your own car not just work for the joint venture and help your own uh, hometown people, you know, basically the slogan, to persuade him. Almost one year, he made hundreds of calls to Mr. Ying to persuade him to quit and come to this Wuhu city to begin the new business. This is how the story begins. Finally, Mr. Ying, together with a group of about a dozen engineers and the technician from the China first automotive plant all moved to Wuhu. Now I have the picture, unfortunately it was not in here, we can show you. It's an agricultural land with rice still in uh, growing. So our dear uh, deputy mayor leading this group of people going there said, here you see, this is your automotive plant. <laughs> and, uh, so it's two vintage, and uh, several thousand will move, like uh, 500 acres of, uh, of land with all this rice growing. He says, here is the future plant. So guys, uh, do we want to work? So they began the process, and uh, the English, uh, uh, British expert helped them to introduce, you know, to uh, install the production line, failed, actually partially. So they learned from working with the English expert. And finally, in 99, they produced the first engine, then began to move to assemble the whole manufacturing, the whole car in China. And the problems now, how the car can be sold in China during that year, car manufacturing was designated as a centrally planned business. It's not a situation you, you, you can, anybody can jump into the open plant producing cars. Now, only three big companies and three small ones were permitted to produce and sell cars in China at the time. The three big ones basically in Beijing, Shanghai, and Guangzhou. The three small ones in other cities. None of them was located in Anhui province. So, given that they have producers and they made investment and uh, the cannot see it. So then the, the, the case was reported to the central government and uh, the central government decided to close it. Now, facing that crisis and the party secretary of Anhui province used his personal connections with Wu Banggu. Okay, he were, that time he, were, he just moved from Shanghai to uh, State Council as Vice Premier. Today he's, you know, the National Congress Speaker, so to speak. But that time he was, you know, just promoted from Shanghai to State Council. So he, Wu Banggui has a relationship with the Shanghai Automobile Industry Group. Using his personal influence and they got a, a relationship between this newly born illegal plant with the Shanghai Automobile Industry Group. The Shanghai Industry Group gives them a license to manufacture and sell the car. So basically, to finding, to establish a new business, every, uh, lots of people involved, you know, from the central government, Wu Banggu, representing the state council, the provincial governor, party secretary, the city government, and our Ying Tongyao, his team from Changchun First Automotive Plant. So I, I was thinking about, in this story, who was that entrepreneur? Now, I, I, I couldn't say, right? it's kind of 
a group of people in different uh, profession who worked together to create the company. Now, and after it's been created, now how the company is run and grow into today's status. Now I find this, there are two types of work. There's a division of labor between Intung Yao's team, the management people who are running business like every CEO in a typical market competitive economy, you know, caring about research and development, manufacturing, cost control, quality enhancement, and marketing and sales, and so on and so forth. So doing business like any other good businessman in this country. But on the other side, John team, I call. Mr. John, remember the deputy mayor of the city government, also as the chairman of the board, led another team of people who are consist of this city government departments, about a dozen of different departments, uh, which we, don't, uh, we never heard about in this country. Those departments are called, let's say, uh, Economic Zone Construction and Development Corporation, which is a government agency, and which buy land, land from the peasants and the developed doing the infrastructure. You have this uh, personnel department of the city government, which help the government to recruit talented people throughout the country, providing hukou. Uh, I don't know how to say it in That's English. Yeah, you, you, you know, in Chinese, you cannot just move around. You, you need uh, some certificate to live in one place and get a job. And uh, help the, the, the people who come to the city move, relocate their wife and, uh, and, and, and the children to be educated into local schools. They have this type of thing. Bank financing, you have financial office directed and administered by the city government, which helps the company to talk with the banks, get finance. They borrow their, 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 their credibility from the, so the government. And also have, you, have, you have this planning, uh, economic affairs committee, you have naval affairs committee, you, you have science and technology, technology commission, which helps you to negotiate with international organizations and uh, uh, government organizations to get money from the Ministry of Finance, uh, Technology and, uh, and, uh, and the Science of the Chinese government. You have a bunch of different agencies and Wuhu city government to work on the Mr. Zhang and helping this. So there are two teams working together. One is the real business side, the other is from the government side. They all work toward the same objective, to create and grow this cherry cooperation. So finally, the most important thing is they have created a cluster of auto parts companies. Now today is about 90 of them, you know, a little bit more than 100 dollars different uh, people throughout the world coming to this location, create parts business, create all kinds of automobile parts. So basically become a huge industry cluster in that city now. Now the government used all the means they have, providing land, financing, help them to sell the parts to Cherry Corporation and also other co companies in Shanghai and in other places. So attracting all the talented people, including a lot, a number of them in uh, Chinese students uh, studied overseas and returning from, you know, to, to, to investing in this area. So create a cluster of business uh, enterprises around the Cherry Corporation. So the, this is a, the, the, the simple story of, I, I, I Mm. So in the end, I find, you know, go through, going, after going through a lot of difficult and challenges, even facing the possibility of being, being uh, bankrupted in the year 2004, Chile finally moved out as an emerging leader in the so-called national brands, uh, autonomous brands or China-made. In Chinese in the uh, automobiles industry, the dominant force has been joint venture between basically Volkswagen, General Motors, and Toyota, Honda. Those are the big names, and in joint venture with the Chinese companies, have been dominant in the Chinese uh, industry of automobiles. 
but since for, since 2005, cherry has been growing fast, uh, beginning from very small size into you know number seven, number six, five, four, moving into the top line the layer of this Chinese industry. Now, looking back, I find this uh, we are ask same, I ask questions to everybody of them saying, without Ying Tongyao, the CEO, could the deal be successful? This project, and many people thought about you know difficult, it might be failed already. Then the other question, given that internal Ying Tongyao and his engineer group moved to Wuhu, but without Zhang, the city and the deputy mayor at that time, today's party secretary, he was assistant mayor, vice mayor, mayor, and then party secretary, also standing member of the provincial government. Party's uh, committee now. Without Mr. Zhang, could that project be successful? The answer is definitely no, it's not possible. So I, I'm thinking this story behind the story is the combination of two different type of people, two different working forces. So I call this partnership toward a business creation and business growth. Now, this is what I learned from this. Uh, story. So I use this, actually I have many, many of this type of examples, but other, other location is not state-owned companies. Rather, the local government will, will assist the local private business to grow. In other, in other places, nearby this, I invested into a heavy truck company. The story goes a little bit different. A private uh, a state created the company, and then they sold out it. The private business bought the major stake, and then the government helped to restructure it and make it one of the leading brands in China. So the different places have different stories, but the major, the key message are the same across different locations. That is, the local government has been a necessary part of those business successes. So why? This is a question I'm, I, I'm asking myself. What is, so uh, I'm asking myself, what is the thing that's driving Chinese local government to become an uh, aggressive pursuit of economic development and economic reform? Now, we know that there are explanations about this. Now, one is saying, you know, China has adopted a gradualist approach to reform. And the other is decentralized, saying Chinese government is decentralized. Now, my, my, my personal uh, um, observation is that decentralization alone will not make a low government a reformer, as in the Soviet Union, uh, today Russia. Now, decentralizing these two rent-seeking, irresponsible, local behavior. Now why China? Different. So I find the tax sharing system is important, which I don't have time to get into detail. Basically, the, 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 the Chinese government devised a type of uh, treasury system which allows local government to share public revenue, tax revenue, with the central government through a systematic way, a contracting-like arrangement. And local government get the revenue from the total public revenue and using their own, the return revenue to finance everything in the local, including paying salaries to the local bureaucrats, officials. And uh, doing anything in the local has to be finan financed through its own source of income. Now, at the same time, the decentralized, decentralization is never complete. The authority of the local government is granted by the central government and decision made by local government has such subject to central regulation and, uh, and, and, uh, and uh, consulting things. So this combination of partial property rights of the local government and uh, effective central leadership, that gives rise to a special political system which leads the way to a new pattern of local government behavior. That's my basic. The second part I'm talking about, the transformation, the extent to which China has been changed. Now, given the time, I don't want, 
ownership st structure change, the state-owned enterprise is now only a small percentage. Now we now have 150 largest companies still owned by state. Beyond that, most of them has been privatized. Now distribution of legend income between state and society, of course, as I said, 18.4 belongs to the state. So all the others become the business and the civil society. Investment, now to 2000, uh, only 4% of the total fixed asset investment come from government budget. That means 90%, 95% more is from market side. Price, of course, today, in, except for some emerging time for selected products, all the prices have been market, uh, uh, market driven. Uh, government regulations and the price autonomy, of course, it's like this country. I think Chinese companies basically enjoy more freedom in terms of contracting than business in this country. Now, we know that from like, Chinese economists like Stephen Chan, Milton Friedman, they traveled to China and found out the Chinese business had faced less regulatory uh, restrictions than companies in England and in this country. So my conclusion is that China reform has crossed the, the fundament, the critical moment between a socialist planned economy and a market economy. Like, uh, I have used this story to illustrate the, the, the key element in explaining Chinese economic reform is this decentralized reform governance, decentralized government structure. Now, the, the key idea I have here is I divided the Chinese government into three different forces, or three, what I call three actors, central leadership, central ministries, local governments. The central leadership, as you know, uh, I learned from economics, has a so-called encompassing interest, a concept used by Orson Mansell, also of University of Maryland, uh, I learned this concept from him. Now, as the, the owner of the country, it has an intrinsic interest to promote economic growth, particularly facing international pressure, competition among nation states in the modern world system. So this is what they have been doing. But as a ruler of the country, they also care about the political power, the legitimacy to rule the country. There is an intrinsic contradiction between efficiency-oriented economic policy and the lead to maintain political rule. Now, that has happened in the Soviet system for many, many years. Every time you want to reform your economic system, you find you have to rely on the central ministries to help you. But the reform always go against the central ministry bureaucrats. Now, they will, will not support your reform. So there is a contradiction between the ruling political legitimacy and the economic reform. Now, uh, that depends on. The balance will change. Now, I'm not going to say too much about the ministry, ministries. They, as we learn from the public choice literature, uh, tend to be naturally a renter seeker. But China has some, 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 some good things about it. At the beginning of the reform, the Chinese central ministry was weak because of 10 years of cultural revolution. The cultural revolution basically uh, dismantled the whole bureaucratic framework for quite a number of years. So by the year of begin, the reform begins, the central ministry was about to be established. So they were weak. Local governments, as I mentioned, where in China has been changed. Tax sharing system is one. Second, the local government also possesses executive power. That's designed by Deng Xiaoping, uh, called decentralization, letting local people do their own things. So they have the policy room. Thirdly, they have their own resources, as I mentioned during the lunch. Land, banking finance, and other things that they own. And now, given this, they have motivation 
to develop the local economy. They have this autonomy to make decisions and, and publish new policies. And then also they have their own resources, particular land. The ownership of the land belongs to the state, but the actual controlling power rests with the local government. And as we know, as a, uh, for an underdeveloped economy, land is the most important resource. And given those conjecture of autonomy to do things, motivation to develop, and broad command of local resources, the Chinese local government then tend into from a typical bureaucracy into a partial businessman. They are mobilizing their local resource to create the jobs, to grow uh, the GDP, increase their share of revenue. That's what has been doing. So the whole country become a competitive field in which not only the business firms competing against each other, but the local governments in terms of thousands competing against each other. We have 20,000 or uh, 2,000 counties. 600, about 600 prefecture level cities, plus maybe 20,000, uh, together we have 50,000 towns, but 20,000 at least established towns with real economic resources. Now all those local entities competing against each other in terms of attracting business, creating better business environment. Uh, so this thing makes this thing. And also, I mentioned Guangdong province and Shanghai to, to show the, 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 the reasons I just uh, talked about. Guangdong, at the beginning of the reform, 1980s, was given a very favorable policy. The facts that I remember is one billion renminbi being paid to the central treasurer. After that, for a fixed uh, length of everything you earned, every money you, you, you increased, will left to you, to the Guangdong provincial government to be utilized for their own purpose. But for Shanghai, the reasoning was Shanghai being the most important industry center of China, you had to contribute all the money you collected from the tax and the profit handling system to the central government to help the central government to manage the difficult process of transformation. So before 1992, your Shanghai was very inactive in promoting local uh, initiative, policy initiatives. But Guangdong has been in the forefront of reform. And, uh, but after 1990s, you know, Shanghai was given the same policy, even you know, more broad autonomy. Then Shanghai suddenly become very reform-minded and the pioneer the, a number of things, as I mentioned, the capital market securities exchange was basically a product of Zhongji uh, when he was the Shanghai mayor. So uh, the story uh, I mentioned the, the, here is we created a three-act system of government, the central leaders representing the country, central ministers with a tendency to resist, and the local leaders, local government, you know, with intrinsic motivation to reform, to grow the economy. So the system dynamics has been changed. This is my major main explanation of why China market-oriented reform can succeed, because a number of, I elaborated on you know, a number of things, number one, political support. Because local government is a part of the system, now the central leaders find it doesn't it have to rely on the central ministers to provide the political support. You can use the local government as a balancing power to, to restrain the, the discretion of power of the central ministers. So secondly, information processing. Originally in the two actor system, the, the, the ministries, you know, the Government bureaucracy basically misled, always collect the inform, bias the information and make evaluation. Every time you have the reform run into trouble, you will get information from the government system saying the reform was run, so you will turn back. In Soviet Union, that was called a treadmill of reform. 
But now in China, you have an open competing system within subsystem within the government. So different type of channels of information being created. That helped. We actually in China we all know that like the uh, anti-spiritual pollution move campaign and the early you know eighties and then uh, anti bourgeois liberalization campaign. You know, basic the, the major endeavor efforts made by the, the anti reforming forces to, to take it back. But every time you see alliance between central leaders and local government leaders broke that stuff. So problem solving, compromising, you know, reform as a fundamental trans transformation and reconfiguration of social groups involves definitely some of the you know the regrouping of the society. And the the one who lost is the bureaucrats. And the one who won is the business group. But the business might not in, was not in the position to negotiate with the government bureaucrats in, during the process because they are not in the same platform. And there was so-called transaction cost problems as we learned in economics. But given this, local government orientation toward the reform, they are in the position to negotiate with the ministry bureaucrats. They use the same language, ide ideological background. They sit in the same conference room, meeting rooms every year. So they, are, they can negotiate with each other. Actually, we have a lot of stories about this. You know, the negotiation between like Shenzhen government with certain ministries, between Shanghai government with another ministries. You know, the negotiation was separate, uh, divided into you know, specific issues and focus on specific regions, and that, that become much easier. Local experimentation, by saying that, I'm saying, uh, I mean that the local governments, once they become reform-minded, tend to create its own solution to reform the big reform issues. The, ref, the, the big problem of reform become issue-oriented. So, Different locations come up with different solutions. And there is a market now, a quasi market for institutional solutions. Now, if somebody get a good measurement, policy initiatives, that can be quickly learned by others. Imitation going on. So this is, this is organizational learning taking place in China. Uh, with stories like this can be hundreds and thousands. You have so many different things coming up from different places. As Chinese economists, economists all know that Chinese reform actually not a product of central government design. It's not thing of coming from a blueprint. It, almost every major measures, policy initiatives was created by, invented by peasants, or business groups in certain areas, and then promoted by, uh, learned by other people, and spread it out. Finally, they pushed the central government to modify their old policy to adopt the policy to new changing situation. That, that was the pattern, pattern for the last 30 years already. So that created, of course, the problems of what I call soft legal constraint, because every piece of legislature in China can be violated. Basically, almost the major, all the major reforms at the beginning was a violation of the existing law at that time. That, 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 that's how reform get started. So all this can come together, as I we see a uh, different government system here. Now with the major day-to-day -day business being a governing, being decentralized to the local government, the central government now actually enjoys more freedom and more using their resources, thinking about long-term strategic issues as we know as Deng Xiaoping did in his years. You know, he was worried about the world competition in the world and the technological revolution 
leading change in the world and things like that. And now they're thinking about the new leadership of China, thinking about how long they will rule the country. You know, this is uh, something in their mind, very real issues they have been talking about. You know, they, they are talking about learning to rule. And th they have this uh, room to, to think about. And uh, so I think this three-party interaction model of reform governance or government systems changed the old politic dynamics of empire China tradition. So we are com coming out of the cyclical move uh, into a sustainable progress. This is, uh, then I, to help uh, you understand, I use uh, three examples. I guess I don't, I'm running out of time, so I'm not going into the details of the examples. The uh, household responsive <coughs> system is the first reform in China, in rural side, rural China transform the Chinese communal system into formal household farming, basically. That's the first reform. And the reform of state-owned enterprises, the second one, opening and development of a capital market, the third one, the core of capitalist society. So I, I, I used the three, but I, I wrote the basic message there. They the share the same message, basically, is every time this reform was initiated by local people, supported by local government, and the fighting against certain central minister intervention. Finally, the central leadership come to support the local initiatives, and then new documents of policy being promoted. That's the same pattern. So, and as a result of this reform, as I see it, it's a new type of market economy. I call it three dimensional market economy. The reason why I call it three dimensional is because in a typical market economy, it's state versus business firms, two actors, two dimension. The business companies competing against each other for market market share. The government regulated the market competition at the same time perform providing social and public services. But in China today, you have not only government and the business firms. Within the government, you have central government who perform the macro social functions. But the local government perform two different types of functions. One side, they are agents of central government providing local public services. But on the other side, they were like businessmen pro promoting business, doing investing. Uh, marketing and sales, financing, recruiting, so on and so forth. So you have this subsystem of the local governments competing against each other. So you have competitive governments, competitive companies, and central government. Those are three different type of forces. As I see, this is a kind of different type of market economy emerging. Uh, I, I don't know how to describe the dynamics or the operating mechanics of the system yet. But I mentioned a number of them by observation, just very prelim preliminary observation. Number one is this system intrinsically tend to grow fast, but with a higher rate of investment. The reason has been simple. The, the marginal rate uh, cost of funding a business is significantly low than that in a typical market economy. Because the government subsidizes part of the funding cost. You know, that there was, uh, I wrote uh, that thing in Chinese. You know, I, my personal experience, uh, more or less, you know, for the key companies attracted by local government, you could save you know, half, 30%, 40%, 60% of your investing money. The money would come from the government. Then, Later on, if you succeed, then you have to pay the government back in terms of the increased tax revenue. If you failed, the government runs the risk. So it's the government using their resources as land, uh, money, to be a co-investment into your project. So by that, I, I, I figured that actually reduced your business startup, startup cost. So that 
as economics can show you, increase your marginal tendency to investing. That costs higher rate of investment than a typical market economy. So that costs a phenomenon we observed. The Chinese economy, the major problem faced by Chinese economy is they're always overheating, high rate of investment, too much investment, too much growth. You know, not like a typical market economy in Western countries. That was cyclic. And then the key problems here was insufficient <coughs> aggregated demand. So it's opposite to the Chinese market economy. Now, there's the second, level, of course, the overhead transaction cost is significantly reduced. Now, by that, I mean this is pretty academic. You know, in economics, we have a branch called transaction cost economics. This tra transaction cost, basically, the being studied basically is mean that during the negotiation and, and contracting process, you know, cost occurs as you have to find the information, signing the contract, enforcing the contract. But here, I'm saying outside the business process, you also occur, uh, pay the transaction costs in terms of getting the land. You have to negotiate with the peasants in terms of you know, hundreds. If like Chera Corporation moved about 1,000 families out of the rural land and uh, get them relocate, relocated. If that was done by Chera business, it could be a long, time-consuming and hard negotiation by a company with different families. But the government did it for them. So they just got a land, piece of land. This type of thing includes labor policy, environment standard, all the kind of things. So I call this overhead transaction costs, not the real business transaction costs. In Chinese, the, so the, that come up uh, is derived from the pro-business tendency of the local government. Then, given this high rate of investment, you have problems of production capacity. It's often overexpanded. You have surplus, redundancy in different locations. You saw a lot of similar structure in different cities. You know, as we know, that's a waste of resources. And then the four, fourth, fifth, and sixth is all about the social, public services, infrastructure, and education, you know, environment protection, labor protection in this system tend to be overlooked, insufficiently provided. So that's also intrinsic problem of this three dimensional market economy, in which and finally the corruption is another big problem today. Since the government so many different government agencies are involved into promoting business, directly involved in business activities. So it's difficult to to actually to, to, to clearly define what is corrupt, what is not. That's become a very mucky problem in a muddling but not through yet. The, the government is working hard to try to define you know, make a line between corruption and the reasonable compensation, but that's been very difficult. So the corruption has been rampant and uh, uh, efforts are being made Progress we observed, but it's still a big problem in China today. So, uh, as I see the system today we see in China, runs into a lot of trouble and problems, negative uh, effects. But the key is that it creates a sustainable growth. So long as it has a, the resource which can be mobilized, so the resources come from the internal dynamics, not just some chance factors. Now, given that, I think the, the system now is facing a challenge, how to fix the problems. Now, that's the recent development, the new policies uh, promoted by the, this government now, for the last five years. This government of Hu and Wen ha, ha, has been working on so-called new view of a scientific view of development. They, they were launching a campaign against the, the called pure GDP 
dominant view of uh, development. So they're trying to include the social indicators into the development endeavor. How to what extent they can be successful, we have to watch. Now my idea is Chinese government has a long way to go to invent or f- discover all the kind of policy tools that lead to address the imba- internal imbalance created by the, this system. Now just like market, the typical market economy in his, its first 100 years, you know, before Keynes' Keynes revolution, uh, before macroeconomic policy was invented, the market economy in Western Europe and this country also had gone through you know, cyclical movements resulting in disastrous events like the 1930s, the big Great Depression. And finally, with Keynesian revolution, we find a certain type of policy tools to address this. We also find uh, uh, invented this welfare system to help uh, counterbalance the internal inequal among social groups. Now, I think the Chinese government is in its early stage to address these problems. Now, but uh, as I see, the, the system has its uh, competitive advantage, also disadvantage, compared with the typical Western-style market economy. Now, we call both market economy, particularly Chinese government like to be called market economy. Now, as I mentioned, there are two different sub, 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 uh, subspecies at the least. And so, uh, for the China type of market economy, Little research has, has been done. How it works and uh, the issues like that, not sufficiently discussed. So it's not a surprise to find the Chinese government today always run into you know, self-contradictory policies because we don't have a theoretical framework to, address, to understand the problem. We don't have the policy tools to address the the, the, the crisis and not a negative side effects of, of the system running. So my observation is, uh, or my conjecture, is the system will continue. The so-called three time the market economy will continue because it's now it creates momentum for growth, which is still the most important agenda on the Chinese government mind. But at the same time, they create a lot of problems for not only for the country, also for the worldwide balance of uh, the market economy. So there's a lot of work uh, need to be done. And in the end, I, you know, discussing with Liu Chai as a historian, we try to figure out what it means, what the 30 years reform means for the Chinese historical evolution. As we all know that last two, 20, uh, 2,000 years history, Chinese uh, has, society has gone through a cyclical, dialectic movement, you know. Is this a uh, change, a uh, movement away from that, out of a cyclic cycle? Or as many Chinese mainstream economists are thinking today, a transition from old China uh, empire toward a Western type of market economy, private ownership, democracy, democracy, that type of thing? Now, I don't know. So I raise the question. Mm-hmm. Uh, it, a Chinese economy become, finally become a typical capitalist system? Uh, will this reform eventually transform Chinese civilization into a Western-style one? Or the Chinese people are creating a new thing? that both modern and Chinese. And that I don't know. But I give you a couple of the, the things I observed. I think this reform is fundamentally different from the reform of the transformation we or transition we observed in Russia and the former Eastern European countries. Because in th- those places, is it the cause they return to Europe? or technically, they are a result of the Big Bang reform. Mm-hmm. So basically, somebody from this country mm-hmm. now 
designed a blueprint for this country. Then, bang, a big bang, jump from old communist system toward uh, this blueprint of Western style, uh, style systems. But in China, that was not the story. The whole, this whole process of change has been led by the Communist Party itself. Okay. Now, I understand that there are three different forces working behind this, this movement. Number one is the socialist culture. With the Communist Party, this socialist ideology and certain type of traditions cultivated by the party. That has been in place for a lot of years, since 1921. That has be become part of China today. And it will be a continuous force participating in the shaping of China's future. Traditional value, of course, you know, everybody loves that. We are Chinese. And regardless, we like it a lot. You know, we cannot change that. And uh, if you live in countryside, not in Shanghai and Beijing, you, you can realize you know, this is very stubborn force, and uh, it will, it will keep working. Intellectual and material influences from learning uh, outside world, basically Western civilization. As we know, you know uh, hundreds and thousands of Chinese students are being sent to this country, to European countries, to study social sciences, not just hard sciences. And many of them have returned to China to run the government, to run the business, to run universities. You know, that's a real, very powerful uh, influence. We can see it in every debate about every reform in China. You will see most of the, the people who participate in the debate will use foreign countries particularly the United States, as their role model or as their uh, argument to against certain type of thing, depending on their reading of what the United States is. So this the social sciences developed here, and the, the experience accumulated here become part of China the driving force of moving China forward. Now, these three different type of things working together shape, will shape the future of China. So I would say this is an indigenous institution learning and innovation process. It's not jumping, transitioning from A to B, with B as a low end state. We don't have end state yet. And the person that I welcome, I, I like to see this result. You know, we like to see the world consisting of different type of options. And uh, as I mentioned, even among these countries we call democracy, liberal democracy, market economy, capitalist system, we have p country like Japan, Sweden, Denmark, the, the United States. They are also fundamentally sharing the fundamental same belief, value. They are also different, very significant, in institutional configurations, in specific mechanisms, in the specific way how people to live, how people to interact with each other. So, not to say China with 2,000 years uh, history and such a huge size. You know, I don't believe that there is one single and the solution they're waiting us to copy. And I think it's uh, the, the, the history will tell us what kind of social economic system will emerge out of this process. And uh, it's my hope that uh, uh, by joining you know, intellectual exchange through Chinese intellectuals and uh, uh, social thinkers, intellectuals throughout the world, then will enrich the process of understanding and help uh, this changing society to look for a better future. And for that, I thank you for inviting me to be here. And uh, thank you very much.
so much. It was really wonderful. And I just want to uh, mention that if any of you would like to know more about the examples that uh, uh, I'm sure I didn't have time to uh, discuss in full length, they, the paper is on our website. And I believe there are also some copies in the back. Um, we now are very pleased to have two really uh, extremely distinguished commentators to discuss this paper. Our first is Professor Sherman Cochran. He's the Hoosier Professor of Chinese History here at Cornell. Um, he is um, uh, also, I'll just mention, just the recent winner of this year's book prize from the Asian Studies Association for the Best Book in Chinese Studies um, for his uh, new book, Chinese Medicine, Man, Consumer Culture in China and Southeast Asia from Harvard University Press. is probably related in some ways to what we're talking about today. The real reason I thought to invite him is because he's really from the same neck of the woods as uh, Professor Schur, actually. He's an expert in the economic history of, of Shanghai and has worked on uh, in Chinese networks, Western, Japanese, and Chinese corporations in China, 1880-1937. That's his, the title of his earlier book. Um, and also on uh, Shanghai City in a number of ways, a number of other publications. So we're very, very honored to have him today to give comments on it. Oh, there you are. Ah, let's see. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Riles, and uh, thank you very much for inviting me to join you here today. It's a great privilege to speak with you here in the law school, particularly um, on the occasion of a visit from this major delegation from Shanghai, led by Dr. Shi. Um, before I make any comments, I should warn you, uh, especially you, Dr. Shi, that my background is completely different from yours. Uh, like you, I went to graduate school and got a PhD. Um, unlike you, I have never run into business. I have never uh, had first-hand experience as a business person. In fact, it's even worse than that. Um, it's true, as Professor Rao said, that I've written books in Chinese business history, but uh, I, was, I have not even been a consumer of the goods that I wrote about in my uh, Chinese business history books. I wrote a book about cigarettes. <laughs> I don't smoke. Uh, my recent book, as Rao's mentioned, is on medicine and pharmaceuticals. I never take medicine. I'm not even asked for uh, So I do not speak from experience, <laughs> as Dr. Sher does. And I think this is a very critical feature underlying everything he says. He's speaking from practical experience as well as academic study. Uh, this gives his message a, a special poignance and credibility uh, that I wish I could match. If I have no such experience, especially in today's China uh, in business, why am I here commenting on this paper? How could I pretend to do so? Well, Dr. Rouse is a lawyer. Uh, or Professor Rouse is a lawyer. She makes a good argument. She talked me into these remarks. So I'll say a few words in hopes that uh, they're related to what we've heard. Dr. Schur's paper is somewhat different from what he presented today. The general principles and themes and motifs are the same. But the examples are very different. And I'm going to quote uh, a couple of passages from the paper, which did not come directly out of Dr. Schur's mouth today, uh, but which I think are in keeping with what he said. I say this as a preface because I want to seize upon two words that jumped out at me from the page and didn't get quite as much attention, at least not in these very words uh, in the oral presentation. The two words are unique and traditional. And I want to devote my remarks to these two words as used in the paper uh, and as reflected in the oral remarks but not made quite so explicit. As I understand Dr. Schur's central idea in his paper, uh, he's arguing that the key reform has transformed China's economic system from one with two actors, central ministries and central leaders, to one of three actors, central leadership, 
central ministries, and local governments. Dr. Schur labels the old decision-making system of two actors traditional. And he concludes the new system of decision-making by three actors is unique. So these words seem to me rather critical uh, to the nuance that he's giving uh, to his history and analysis of the transition under the reforms. Now, Professor Hockett probably has, is much more, uh, in fact, not just probably, is much better qualified than I am to talk about. Uh, uh, well, now at least let me finish the sentence here. <laughs> uh, to talk about comparisons in the contemporary world. And I'm a historian. I'm not um, as well prepared to make that kind of contemporary comparison, which Dr. Schur emphasized, particularly at the end here, when he mentioned the difference between China and Eastern Europe and some other places. Um, my inclination is to accept Dr. Schur's suggestion that China's current system is unique. But I'd like to ask him to specify in a little more detail how the people in local government, this new third actor, were transformed from inward-looking, parochial, rent-seekers of the late 1970s and 1980s into broad-minded, development-oriented, entrepreneurial investors ever since. The people talking about here in local government. Uh, Dr. Scher emphasized in his paper and in his oral remarks that tax sharing, the tax sharing plan, was the impetus for this uh, transformation. I'd be curious to hear a more a fuller collective portrait or even an individual portrait of the people in local government and what their, how their thinking changed in the course of this transition, this rise of local government, if you will, into full-fledged status as an actor, the third actor uh, in the new system. Has there been a transition from one generation to another? Did the old officials pass and the new ones come in? talking about 25 or 30 years here, um, have, the same, have the officials who've remained the same in local government had some experience in business that caused them to change their approach to economic development? At one point in his paper, Dr. Schur says that local government is induced, quote, to behave more or less like a real entrepreneur. If so, I wonder if you could characterize the people in local government as official entrepreneurs, official hyphen entrepreneurs. Um, the anecdote that uh, opened today's talk I thought was fascinating, and it partially answered my question by giving us portraits of real people. I guess the person in that portrait, the, in that anecdote, that particularly interests me is Mr. Yin. Um, I think you mentioned he was a language and literature graduate. Mr. Chan. Yeah. Literature. Oh, Mr. Chan. So, language and literature graduate, served years in the Wuhu city government. Um, what, made, what prepared him to behave like an entrepreneur? Uh, now, I, mind you, I teach history majors. I think our graduates have a chance to become entrepreneurs. Uh, but I don't think our major is designed to uh, launch them into entrepreneurial careers. And it's hard to see in this sequence of events in, in Mr. Jun's career what caused him to come up with this new attitude uh, uh, in local government. How, to put it a little differently, um, there are three actors here, central leaders, central ministries. These sound so established and, and uh, developed and, and in place. And now we have local government. How does a man like Jen stand up to, play a role comparable to those other big, powerful leaders and institutions? So that's my question about um, uh, the uniqueness of, of local government. I think it is unique, as you describe it, but I want to know a little more about how it got that way. Uh, the other word I wanted to comment on was the word traditional, which I think didn't appear in the oral remarks, but it appeared several times in the paper. Um, 
as used in the paper, uh, it has two different meanings. Uh, one of them refers to the two-actor system existing in the late 1970s, early 1980s. And Dr. Schur says that China has made a transition from the traditional two-actor system to the new, current, three-actor system. So it's gone from the traditional to the modern in that sense. And then toward the end of his paper, uh, as toward the end of his talk, he uses the word traditional in another sense. Uh, let me quote uh, that China had traditional values and practices deeply rooted in thousands of years of Chinese history. Uh, and this thousands of years also, I think, appeared in the remarks, uh, oral remarks we just heard. I am not so keen on your use of this word, Dr. Sher, and I'd like to talk about it for a moment here in either context. Uh, I think the first usage to refer to the late 1970s and early 1980s, the pre-reform two-actor two system, is too narrow, at least for my taste in the use of that word traditional. And I think the reference to thousands of years of Chinese history is too broad, uh, at least, again, for my taste. So first, I hope you will clarify which of these two meanings you wish to give to the word, or whether you want the word to encompass both these things, pre-reform and thousands of years. Uh, and then uh, I'd like to, with all due respect, offer another meaning of traditional that you might consider uh, and that might come into your thinking as you move forward uh, with the reforms. In the periods of the Ming, Qing, and Republican uh, Chinese history, that is roughly the last 500 years of history up to 1949, China had an economic system that I think had three actors. <laughs> Central leadership, local government, and the unofficial institutions of the local elite. These seem to me to be the three actors in the, what I would call the traditional economic system. This third group, uh, in, in, Professor Schur, in Dr. Schur's uh, uh, presentation, the local government is the key group, the pivotal group. Uh, in the traditional system, I would suggest that the uh, local elite is the pivotal group. And it might not be familiar to this audience, so let me say just a word about what that group was. This group consisted of Chinese members of the local elite who managed some official functions even though they did not hold official positions. They did, through so, uh, they did so through uh, unofficial institutions, especially guilds, huiguan, and native place associations, uh, tongxian hui. Uh, they had informal ties with both uh, the central leadership uh, and the central ministries. Um, if we're to put these three groups in Chinese terms, we might say that the uh, central uh, leadership was in the uh, official realm, guan. Uh, the private entrepreneurs in the system were in the private realm, si. And the um, uh, local elites were in between those two, in a kind, if you will, in a public realm. Gong, gong si de gong three realms, three actors. I think this system was traditional insofar as it was widely used in China for 500 years, Ming Dynasty to the mid 20th century. And what I want to ask uh, 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 in relation to uh, Dr. Scher's interpretation here is whether there are any, inter any parallels between the three actor system of traditional China and the three actor system of today's China. I raise this, uh, 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 let me put this a little more in the form of another question. Can we say that just as the official elite were pivotal in China's traditional economic system, so local government is pivotal in today's economic system, the reformed economic system? I'm asking these questions partly because history interests me. I'm a historian. I like to take it on its own terms, but also because Dr. Scher might be able to use this history to his advantage in interpreting today's China. If there are parallels between the traditional three-dimensional system of the past and the current three-dimensional system, 
then maybe Dr. Shi and other reformers in today's China can draw on the old system in support of the new one. Mightn't it be argued that China's current economic reforms are unique and indigenous because they're rooted in China's distinctive history? And therefore, the link between this distinctive history and the present would lend some support and nuance to the uniqueness uh, attributed to it by Dr. Shi. Or, alternatively, is the empire uh, economy, as I think Dr. Shi just referred to it, uh, of the past, irrelevant to today's economic system? Is there no such economic link? Is today's system done in repudiation of that old system? I'd be curious to hear Dr. Shi's comment uh, on these questions. Before I sit down, I want to add that it's a great privilege to have Dr. Sher with us here today. In my experience, it's very rare uh, to hear a practitioner of business in the hustling economy of China uh, speak so eloquently uh, to an academic audience mm -hmm. and with high uh, analytical rigor. Uh, we don't get the chance to hear that very much about uh, today's China. Um, if I may speak in terms of tradition, as I've been doing here repeatedly, I would say one of the great uh, traditions of China is for its leaders to be people of both thought and action. And it's certainly the case that Dr. Sher is a man of, of both thought and action. Thank you for coming. comments from our second commentator, who's been waiting patiently. Um, we're really pleased to have with us also Professor Bob Hockett from the Law School, from one of our own. He's Associate Professor of Law here. Professor Hockett um, has a JSD in law, but he is really um, a cross-trainer. He's trained in both uh, uh, economics and in political philosophy. And these two disciplines really inform his own work. He's written a number of really uh, fantastic articles on the uses, for example, of financialist instruments and other aspects of market economies for effectuating new forms of social distribution and so forth. So very interested in the kinds of questions of institutional design that Professor Sher was talking about. So very pleased that you are willing to do this today. And thank you. And thank you. Well, um, thanks so much, uh, Annalise. And, and thanks to uh, all of you. Um, in the great tradition of the Chinese scholar administrator, the combiner of uh, thought and action, uh, the uh, law school uh, combines thought and action, it seems, every day in the programs uh, that we uh, offer here uh, and uh, in the courses uh, that we offer as well. Uh, my uh, comments, I'm hoping, uh, might serve as a sort of uh, transition or segue uh, uh, from Dr. Schur's very interesting and provoking paper and presentation on the one hand and uh, Dr. Cochran's uh, thought-provoking uh, remarks on the other hand on into uh, tomorrow's and the following day's uh, discussions uh, that are scheduled on uh, pursuant to the program. So uh, Dr. Schur uh, offers us uh, an interesting hypothesis or in the current idiom uh, story uh, by way of accounting for China's uh, impressing, uh, I'm sorry, impressive economic reforms uh, and growth uh, over the past uh, 30 years or so. A uh, key part, and I take it to be in fact the uh, key part uh, of the story, uh, is uh, the role played by local government, uh, well, local governments or local government uh, enterprises uh, in constituting what Dr. Schur uh, labels a third dimension uh, in a, a three-dimensional uh, market economy. Now, um, reform efforts in the former Soviet bloc, uh, Dr. Scher tells us, uh, were hampered uh, in the past uh, by stalemate uh, as between two uh, dimensions, you might say, or two kinds of actor uh, in the traditional uh, post-Soviet economy. Uh, and uh, so, for example, uh, Gorbachev uh, and the Central Committee uh, or the Supreme Soviet and the old Soviet Union uh, might pursuant to the story, uh, decree liberalization uh, of some kind or to some greater degree of, uh, or a greater degree of privatization uh, in the national economy. But the story has it then that uh, bureaucrats uh, down below who by nature are jealous of their traditional prerogatives uh, and who also control or spin information from the ground that goes up are able uh, by dragging their feet uh, and limiting their higher ups uh, access to information that might 
indicate uh, that feet are being dragged, uh, stand in the way of, um, of such reforms. Uh, now in China, uh, by contrast, in Dr. Schur's uh, story, uh, local governments have evolved uh, into a form of enterprise uh, in their own right. Okay? Uh, and they represent, then, in that connection, an intriguing sort of amalgam of public and private, i.e., for profit uh, institution. Uh, owing to those particular uh, attributes, if I understand the story correctly, uh, they possess both the incentives uh, and the capacities, uh, in the form of information on the ground, so to speak to serve as a kind of counterweight uh, to sclerotic bureaucracies that might ordinarily be standing in the way of reforms uh, that have been put forward uh, by the central administrators of the central government. So it's this third uh, new dimension, then, uh, that Dr. Schur uh, suggests, uh, that accounts for China's greater degree of success uh, with market reforms uh, than was, in, was, was enjoyed by the former Soviet bloc uh, nations uh, during those sort of heady uh, days of glasnost and perestroika in the 1980s and immediately thereafter in uh, more traditional uh, two-dimensional uh, economic uh, structures. Now, assuming that I've got the story correct, um, I have no doubt at all, um, in my own mind at least, uh, that local government enterprises have indeed played and are indeed playing a critically uh, important role in China's economic reform uh, and development. Um, I have no doubt partly uh, by dint of the persuasive account that Dr. Schur himself has, has given, uh, and then uh, partly on the basis of uh, papers that I've read here and there, some of them put out by the World Bank, some by other development banks, and uh, some by academics. Um, and they all, uh, I think, lend weight uh, to Dr. Schur's uh, story. Uh, I do want, nevertheless, uh, though, to make a couple of observations, maybe a few observations, and pose a few questions um, that uh, connect, uh, maybe, uh, to uh, the following uh, three questions that I think are, are raised or implicated by the story, uh, notwithstanding uh, its, its, its accuracy. So the first question that it seems to me that hovers over us here in connection with the story is, to what extent uh, is the local government enterprise um, characteristic of China and its role, uh, for that part, for that matter, uh, truly uh, unique uh, to China? Right? So in a way, I'm getting back to Dr. Cochrane's question about uniqueness. But now I'm going to be thinking a little bit more, say, synchronically than diachronically. Okay? So one question then again is, to what extent is the idea of a local government enterprise, at least as described by Dr. Scher, truly unique uh, to China? Or in other words, are there or have there traditionally been across societies and are there perhaps across societies now certain analogs or substitutes or functional equivalents? to uh, local government um, enterprises in other jurisdictions, right, that perhaps have in the past played uh, and currently play and in future might be expected to play uh, roles analogous uh, to those that the Chinese uh, local government enterprise uh, has played uh, in recent years. The um, second uh, question uh, that is, I think, implicated uh, by the story is to what extent do other factors, right, additional uh, to the role played by the local government uh, enterprise in China, uh, account uh, for China's uh, terrific economic successes? Right? And then finally, third, uh, those two questions in turn uh, implicate, I think, a, a third question, which is, you know, are there uh, limits uh, to how far uh, China or any uh, reforming or developing economy might advance uh, by relying upon uh, the means that China appears to have relied upon uh, over the last 30 years or so. So uh, I'll touch on these three questions or sort of briefly indicate this, the sense in which I think that these questions are significant by reference to sort of two, I guess I'll, I'll say, I'll just limit myself to, to, to a couple uh, of um, sort of economic cum historical uh, observations, okay? So uh, the first observation is, is, is as follows. It's the, the idea of a local government or community uh, as a form of enterprise or a sort of communal business doesn't seem to me to be quite unique to China. Perhaps the scale of the importance that these enterprises have uh, uh, occupied or, 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 or played, um, the, role, the scale of the role that they played in China is unique, but the idea itself uh, doesn't seem to be as unique as might initially uh, uh, appear. So, for example, um, it looks to me uh, as though uh, the idea of a community enterprise or a communal form of enterprise 
uh, is actually a, a rather commonly encountered uh, form of enterprise organization or enterprise arrangement, at least at certain early-ish stages of economic development. Okay. Uh, so for example, uh, many people presumably are familiar with uh, the Israeli kibbutz right, as an institution, as an economic institution, which in the early days, in the late 1940s and throughout the 1950s and early 60s, seems to have discharged functions on the one part, on the one hand, that were economic in nature, right, those of a, of a traditional uh, enterprise, but also uh, to have discharged many uh, local government uh, type functions or communal uh, type functions, okay. Um, things have changed uh, since those heady early days of the kibbutzim uh, in ways that I think will prove to be significant um, when I get to them in a moment. Uh, secondly, uh, similar uh, such arrangements uh, seem to uh, basically combining of local government or communal type functions on the one hand and enterprise type functions on the other seem to have characterized at least some of the co-ops um, that have been encountered in certain other uh, countries in not so distant years. Uh, the Basque region of Spain uh, comes to mind, for example, some of the co-ops that have been, uh, have occupied an important role in the Spanish economy in the recent past. Perhaps uh, Yugoslav, the Yugoslav experience as well uh, might offer parallels. Finally, going back a little bit further, if you go back um, just 200 years or so um, in the United States uh, experience, something a bit like this mix of public and private, i.e. for-profit uh, functions, and also something a bit like the mix of public-private uh, style property arrangements, uh, seems to have characterized many early uh, colonial societies uh, across the globe, and in particular along the eastern seaboard uh, of the United States. Right? So there were, um, you know, we all know the old story of that, the, the tragedy of the commons that figures uh, in uh, to um, uh, many economists' uh, tales, uh, stems directly out of an arrangement of this sort, right, where you have a common land area where privately held cattle all graze uh, together, right? Um, many of the American colonies, as some of you know, or at least some of them, uh, began as uh, proprietary colonies, as enterprises, in effect, but also then as localities because they had to be spatially located, right? Uh, and indeed, the U.S. practice of written political constitutionalism that's often cited as a sort of unique contribution of the American polity uh, to uh, global legal uh, or global legality might, it seems, it seems, might possibly, might very possibly, I should say, indeed, have evolved, in part at least, uh, from the, pa the practice of adopting compacts or corporate charters on the part of the early colonies, whose corporate charters or certificates of incorporation, so to speak, evolved into the idea of a state constitution, which then evolved into the idea of a written national constitution. So uh, the suggestion I'm trying to make uh, here uh, then, oh, and then finally I should note that you know, we still speak, by the way, of, of incorporating townships and cities right, across America, as any student of local government law uh, quickly uh, learns. And indeed, um, Henry Hansman actually teaches um, in his uh, course that he offers on advanced uh, enterprise organizational law, the <laughs> local government as a particular form of enterprise organization that has many continuities with um, the more traditional uh, economic form of enterprise organization. So uh, the significance of these um, observations, I think, for, the, for our present purposes, and sort of, again, looking ahead to the uh, presentations that are be to be given in the next couple of days, uh, I think is, is, is several fold. Uh, for one thing, it suggests that this uh, curious hybrid status of the Chinese village enterprise uh, and uh, that enterprise's role uh, in development might simply be uh, one more instance in the Chinese, on the Chinese scene, of uh, an oft encountered type that we find across uh, spaces and across times. Uh, for another thing, it suggests at least the possibility that this particular type uh, of uh, organizational form uh, might be limited to a particular stage of development, say, right? right. Again, once those particular attributes, those that bind to a locality and those that bind to a particular entity or organization um, diverge, one presumes uh, that enterprises themselves then might be less apt to be communes or localities or communities or local governments, right? Finally, third, um, then, um, once local governance functions and enterprise functions do uh, diverge, enterprises themselves, as distinguished from localities, often, as we know, grow very large, right, pursuant to the more uh, strictly uh, scale eco economic and regulatory determinants of enterprise size, right? Uh, and in that case, it's natural uh, to expect, or at least to anticipate or, or, or to worry, 
um, that these enterprises themselves might come to constitute Mr. Scherr's third dimension instead of the local government enterprise, right? They themselves will serve, presumably or possibly, as counterweights to uh, bureaucratic uh, inertia. Um, and indeed, that seems to be what firms do, right, all over the place, uh, in the United States in particular these days, right, in, and in many developed economies, to the point that we actually worry now more about bureaucrats not simply not stymieing development, but actually being captured, is right, the term of art, captured by the enterprises themselves, right? And we likewise worry about races to the bottom, as we put it, by localities themselves, who are eager to attract large and mobile, mobile uh, business enterprises to them. Right? And by the way, in that connection, uh, that observation, I think, dovetails rather uh, nicely uh, with one of the operative dynamics uh, that Dr. Scher himself uh, pointed out to, right? This idea that, well, labor and environmental standards tend to decline or tend to be, uh, 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 get less play um, in the rush to develop in these early stages. Also, by the way, uh, in, in, insofar as we look at the uh, local enterprise or the local government enterprise, as an innovate, as a, as a sort of locus of innovation, note that in happier times, uh, we refer to our race to the bottom in the United States or other developed economies as uh, a, a case of uh, the existence of laboratories of democracy, right? So it's the laboratories of democracy um, that we happily call them in happy times, and then in harder times, we say that those very laboratories are racing to the bottom, basically in order to satisfy the imperatives that are demanded by successful large private enterprises. So I'm tempted to say then that uh, there's, a, there's a great deal of sort of conceptual continuity between the three tracts uh, that uh, Dr. Schur uh, points to uh, in the Chinese scene on the one hand, and three tracts that we find in other economies as well, including the developed economies now. The second and final uh, economic cum sort of historical observation uh, through which I'd like to sort of take a look at or briefly address those three big questions that I mentioned that are raised for me at least by uh, Dr. Scher's very interesting paper is this one. Um, another respect in which China's development story um, reminds me of other development stories that I've encountered here and there is that of what might be called uh, its maybe neo-mercantilist aspect. And that's not really a dirty word. It might sound like one, but it doesn't have to be viewed that way. It seems to me, though, that part of the story uh, that Dr. Scher tells us is a story of what it looks to be a, a form of uh, induced saving um, and, invest and, 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 and directed investment uh, on the part of the uh, central government uh, in China. Right? Um, in fact, um, this is my reading of uh, what Dr. Scher referred to uh, as the marginal rate of investments being higher uh, in China. Uh, and um, again, that was another aspect of the operating dynamic of the three-track economy. Now, um, a similar story of induced uh, saving uh, and directed investment seems to unfold in connection with lots of other uh, rapid development stories that we find in other jurisdictions, right? Beginning uh, with Japan in the 1950s and 1960s, uh, proceeding to South Korea in the 1970s and 1980s, and then beyond throughout East Asia over the 1980s and the 1990s. Uh, some of you will uh, recall that not that long ago, uh, there used to be talk of a so-called East Asian economic miracle, right? Um, before that, there was uh, talk of uh, a miraculous European economic rebound, right, in the 1950s. And if you read some of the American history literature, you'll find that uh, there's frequent talk of a so-called U.S. economic miracle or market revolution uh, that unfolded during the 19th century. Now, another thing, uh, in addition uh, to uh, the story of, uh, and, and by the way, all of those miracles also involved induced or incentivized or sometimes even forced saving and government directed or at least government incentivized or channeled investment in certain directions. Probably the best known story in that connection is, is the, the Miti story in the case of Japan. Right? Now that of course calls to mind uh, another aspect of this basic story. So another thing in addition uh, to induced saving and guided investment uh, that seems to have uh, 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 been uh, present in the case of all of these uh, miracles, what they all had in common, that is to say, in addition to uh, induced savings and guided investment, was so-called uh, export-led growth policy. This is where the neo-mercantilist idea gets its purchase, right? 
So that's to say that government policy in all of these cases seems to have been geared largely toward concentrating capital in large part through, again, induced uh, or incentivized saving, and then channeling it toward the development of export industries, right, uh, in order uh, to gain uh, badly needed foreign exchange for the economy in question, right. And there's considerable evidence, it seems to me, and some of it is borne out, I think, by some of what Dr. Scher himself has said, uh, that this is at least part uh, of the Chinese economic uh, growth story, right? But there are, uh, of course, uh, well-known, maybe not as well-known as they ought to be, uh, limits uh, as to how far and how long uh, an export-led growth strategy uh, can be sustained and can be the principal leg upon which economic growth uh, proceeds. At some point, as we know, after regular uh, global demand and liquidity uh, crises, usually stemming from overcapacities of the kind that Dr. Scher pointed to, from the 18th century onward, uh, nations have generally had to turn at some point towards stimulating and facilitating uh, domestic demand, right? Uh, and domestic, uh, uh, I should say, domestic demand for domestic products, at least as vigorously as they work to stimulate foreign demand for those products. And in fact, there's a nice parallel here, I think, between this idea, this idea that at some point uh, nations have to turn toward internal growth instead of just going toward external or export-led growth, between that story on the one hand and the story uh, of competition among the uh, Chinese uh, local government enterprises themselves, right? One way of viewing the competition that's been fostered in China between local government enterprises themselves is as the inducement of a kind of neo-mercantilism among those localities themselves, inducing them to try to compete with one another for a limited supply of, of wealth uh, in China, rather on a par with the way uh, in which neo-mercantilist export-led growth economies compete for global market share. All right? Now, interestingly, that, I mean, so that might sound a little bit pessimistic at first, but I don't actually mean it that way. It's actually in this connection that I find most hope uh, in uh, Chinese uh, innovations of the sort uh, that Dr. Scher has called our attention to uh, and of other sorts uh, as well. Uh, even while I'm expressing or feeling some degree of concern over uh, where uh, continued export-led growth strategies are likely to lead. So here's what I mean. One way that you foster uh, the growth of internal demand, and thus a deep internal market, rather than only relying on an external market, is by ensuring uh, a fairly uh, equitable distribution of growth's benefits themselves, and indeed of the assets pursuant to which growing uh, is carried out. That way the recipients of today's growth, uh, today's growth's benefits, uh, can become tomorrow's customers or consumers, and indeed uh, engines of further growth. This too is a very old story, a very well-known story. It's in fact a commonplace of development theory uh, that one reason that accounts for the comparative success of North American, North European, and many East Asian economies uh, in comparison to many other economies and their, their miracles is precisely their comparatively egalitarian uh, distributions of productive assets um, during the critical phase of transition to an internal development of an internal market. You might think Homestead Act versus Hacienda here. That's the basic story. Um, and um, Zhiyuan might know, I think it's Ha Jun Chang who has written a great bit uh, along these lines of basically making these comparisons. Uh, and there's a lot of interesting statistical evidence that seems to bear out the hypothesis. Now, it seems to me that if China proves able to innovate with its proper property regime uh, as creatively in future as it has done up till now, uh, it might, we might well have, uh, in the case of China, a reason to hope uh, not only for a much more sustainable uh, form of economic growth within China, but indeed a renewal of sustainable growth uh, elsewhere uh, as well. So I guess I'll leave it at that and, and thank you again for a very stimulating and provocative paper. Thank you so much, Bob. We're actually um, over time, but I do want to give uh, Dr. Scher a chance to respond, if you would like. Would you, would you like to respond to any of the questions? Or? You don't have to. It's up to you. We have two historians here together with me. <laughs> Liu Chang is trained as a professional historian in study. And Chen Ping also a physicist and a historian. So I think if you have anything to say, I could. Uh, you you, you I, say it first. Um, <laughs> um, okay. well, to 
appreciate all the time. I appreciate that both of you's comments in a way help us to, to do further research on that. In terms of uniqueness and the, the, the meaning of the tradition, uh, for the first one, uh, I have to think of more about it, the, the relationship between today's system and the uh, Qing dynasty systems. <laughs> to be frank, I'm, I'm not so sure about the Qing systems, but I don't know much about it, so I have to do more study on that. For the use of the term tradition, I kind of was a little bit careless, not really thought about it, just, uh, you know, an ordinary way. When we talk about Chinese history, we use tradition. And when I try to compare the system pre-existed before the reform, and I just happen to use the tradition. So the, 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 I, but the mo in typical case, we use tradition to describe the historic China, not the pre-reform China. Okay, but for his comments, it go beyond uh, my knowledge in different countries. Now, one thing I would like to mention, uh, re relating to your comments, is I feel this. The, um, I'm not saying this. Uh, the local government, as local government created a business. This is just from my the, the story I told. Actually, the real situation. Now they don't create many government enterprises. Yeah. The major work they are doing now is promoting them. They are using the resource, the resource, land, financial resource, credibility, to to help the business to, to be created, and that that's what they are, they are doing. And more important is that the competing against each other. But in like the old Chinese times, Qing Dynasty, I I I I I didn't find that happening. You know, the competition between different counties. Today, the competition among different cities are really tough. And even in this story, the Wuhu city succeeded in creating cherry corporation, corporation producing cars. Mm -hmm. Now, in the capital city of Anhui province. The second car manufacturing com company was created a year ago with even bigger investment raised in both through the government channel and also through the market. Mm. So they are competing. The two sister cities in the same province. Mm. As we know, Quinshan, the Liu Bai city to Shanghai, mm. competing against the Shanghai for many, many years now and uh, very successful to Quinshan. The, the, the background has been changed. In the old times of the Qing dynasty, there was little industrial opportunities. So the county the county officials and local units basically doing very minimum economic development activities. I have a problem run, you know. But today you have this industrial revolution uh, actually imported from Western world, you know, the technology and the output, uh, the product all available there. So the, the counties and cities, the <coughs> provinces competing by not just eating out others, but creating business to, to sell around the world. Mm. Uh, I think that those might be the differences between today's uh, competing local governments and the old ones. And in terms of the, this, uh, the, the government uh, related business, that existing in different countries in different periods of time, uh, I think it's, a, it's an interesting phenomenon. I <laughs> will need to more study on that. See, uh, uh, of course, I, I understand the point here. I'm not sure that the Chinese system today will be lasting for a long, long time. I, I don't know how long it will exist. It may be changed some, some days. Mm -hmm. But my central message is this is a real uh, answer to the problems the Chinese government tried to, to solve mm -hmm. for the last 30 years, it has, has been successful. 9% uh, average rate of growth is, is a remarkable thing. And at the same time, the system has been changed, fundamentally changed. It's a revolution. Mm -hmm. So I haven't seen any country in the world of history in the last 2,000 years that happened. Twice, two things together. Actually, I have four things. I only said two. Four <laughs> things coupled together was happened in 30 years period. 9% annual rate, average growth, a peaceful revolution, fundamentally changes the, the, the system from the one part state to a market economy, plus you know, a large scale 
uh, increase in living standard across every section of the of the society, and plus very few incidents of large scale social conflict, conflict, violence. You know that was minimal in China. The four things putting together, so I call this is one of the probably unique historical phenomena in the whole history of 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 the world. Now I probably run you can correct me. That's, that was my reading uh, of the thing. So I I think even it's short lived in next twenty years it was changed. This episode of reform will still be worse off explanation, some explanation. And as I said, even in the change later, the new things emerging emerging out of this today's situation will have some share some continuity to the day. So uh, that that's my point. But I, I think you the several comments you made I'm very interested. I like to know more about, about those stiff like homestead actor, the Israel uh, form of thing uh, <laughs> I, I read a little bit of I forgot the, the, the pronunciation. I, I'm interested in this, so I, I know them more about it. Well, I think we Thank can you. maybe continue the conversation over a drink downstairs. Um, but before you go, we just want to thank you. And, you know, kind of in the tradition, the Chinese tradition of saying that we hope the relationship is not just one generation, but many. I should say <laughs> that Dr. Sure just had a baby. So this is something. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.